The Nintendo 3DS. Oh, what a babe. What an antique, right? Oh, man, I really love this thing. Who doesn't? Oh, tell me. No, really, tell me! It was a unique, one-of-a-kind console with tons of great games. You know, masterpieces. So many gems I haven't played, but the gaming website assures me these are gem quality. And hey, you can't forget how the 3DS was the first Nintendo handheld, truly capable of 3D. Both literal and scam. I mean, yeah, sure, right. Oh, the DS could do 3D, just like I do know how to whistle. It is not even remotely comfortable to look at. Even though it was a handheld console, in a time when mobile gaming was seemingly taking over, 3DS managed to reach Okay, sales, with over 70 million units sold. And that's Nintendo's worst selling handheld. Oh, this worst selling handheld got the company through its worst financial time ever. You know, we all have those moments. Even if it had less of a casual crowd this time around, it clearly still struck a chord in lots. I think most people who got one just wanted some Nintendo feel. As weirdly enough, Nintendo totally forgot to release a console that generation, opting to develop this te terrifying accessory for the Wii. It was either that or some parent who wanted to distract their dirty, ungrateful brat, constantly needing food, love, and the cigarette ash taken out of their water. Uh, your Pokemon, your Mario, your Cars 2, yeah, I'm just kidding. Cars 2 was the ceiling, we all know it. Basic bitches weren't gonna buy Bunga Bunga's relatively decent adventure when Mario was sitting right there. Basic bitch. Me, me basic bitch. I too pretty much only played the hits on my 3DS for many years until I actually decided to expand my horizons and try out Donkey Kong. It's not that I wasn't interested, just that when I was a kid, I, I, I didn't have that much money for games. So like most kids, I am not a special person. There's only so much you can get without selling what you do have. So why the hell are you gonna buy one potentially good 3DS game that you're kind of unsure about when you could grab Five PS2 games you know are terrible for less. You need to think smart if you want to make it in this world. However, everything has changed. I am the system's bitch and I get doula now. These days, I can buy all the terrible games I want. But let's not talk about my career. This special little guy was home to a lot of unique experiences. And games, too. So go the hell to your kitchen. Grab a soothing, delicious cup of boiling water and uh, blow off some steam. <laughs> The legends say, after creating Super Mario 12, wait, no, no, hang, hang on, it was Super Mario 17! Well, after doing that, he had to do it, he just had to go there, Shiggy had to owe those words to the Fire Emblem developers. A good game is good, but a bad game is bad. You know what the gentleman over at Intelligent Systems said? Shut up, Miyamoto, we're making sexy chess! But then... Sexy Chess 12 finishes. Hmm, what now? You see, the next step was obviously codenamed Steam. Obviously, it's just what you do. The game was universally praised on reveal and there was a mountain of hype piling up. Little by little, by little. How did that pan out? Well, I'll stop being sarcastic and say a codenamed Steam is a good game. And then genuinely worth your time. See, see, I have restraint. A strategy game, but it's in third person. But it's also a shooter. But it, 
fences arthritis. Yeah, well, I bought this game brand new for £2.49 in 2021. It came out in 2015. So clearly it must have bombed hard. While they never revealed overall sales figures, we know it sold 30,000 in its first month in the USA. And from the charts they released in the later years, according to Steam wasn't even found to have reached a million. That's not great. And they must have made way too many copies to the point that new versions were still hanging around seven years later. It goes without saying that that isn't too common with a first party Nintendo game. Maybe Nintendo expected it to do better, but I don't remember it even being marketed very much at the time. It's like the very idea of the game pissed the whole company off. But why? did it do real. This was a perfect ringer for success on the 3DS, right? A Nintendo published game from the developers of Fire Emblem Awakening, the game that moved more copies than Sonic Extreme and Mega Man Universe combined, single-handedly revitalizing the franchise in the West, increasing the audience tenfold. They made hundreds of fans with that game. Yeah, those guys making a fresh, unknown IP that no one has heard of before, with 18 different control schemes caring to a niche audience, mashing up different genres to become even more of a niche on a platform that already isn't the most interested in strategy games having the name of an experimental kitchen appliance. Barely pushing the marketing. It's, it's, it's a, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. However, unlike Fire Emblem, which was also made by Intelligent Systems, it bombed and didn't get 42 chances to succeed. Sorry, 41. So far, at least, they've kind of just left the IP to rot. But what the hell even is wrong? Huh. Let's beep this out. The gameplay works by utilizing the namesake a backpack of limited steam. This is also the energy that determines your ability to move and shoot within each stage. You need to destroy illegal aliens who step into your country. Now, as we know, aliens do travel in single file, so reinforcements coming back in one by one are gonna be an issue no matter how many you've taken out, generally. Move one character to the end goal area without dying, you're a winner. Sometimes your missions change and evolve as going the Queen of England. Coins you find in the level that you save the game mid-mission, doubling as a refill for your character or everyone's steam. This is so useful, it, it feels like I'm cheating. You can use all of your turns up and then just do even more to the enemy by having more steam from these save areas. Take a new position or grab a life-changing, radical, cool, tubular collectible as a, uh, so there's five of them usually, so that's a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a neat incentive. Each character is entitled to an ultimate, and unsurprisingly, game developers just keep copying Overwatch. <laughs> Kidding. Overwatch was an owl at this point, so they copied Super Smash Bros. Brawl. Ultimates are a big help in turning the tide, while not whittling the strategy down to pressing a win button. Each character brings something different to the table, and playing to each of these guys' strengths is kind of crucial to being able to move around the map in succession. I'll admit, I'm not the big strategy game guy. I mean, I don't calculate my attack chance on breathing, and I'm, I'm pretty confident in my ability. So I'm not sure how special Codename Steam is to other strategy games. Levels and your survival can get so intense, and it's easy to make a simple mistake like moving an enemy's sightlines or forgetting to take the Silas with you in the toilet, forcing you to use the game's base controls. Let's talk about that. It's uh, it's weird, but also cool that you have different choices. The Silas being the most optimal by far. The camera is a major factor to take in. And if you don't have the new knobs, you need to cope with what they give. You have to cope with the most optimal control scheme. It takes time to get used to this whole scheme. Outright not feeling good in the first hour. It is unusual after all, but after you play and get used to it, it complements the gameplay perfectly, and using an Xbox controller or mouse just wouldn't feel the same. The whole framework is so well made. It's a jolly time executing aliens, always planning out my next moves, laying waste to the country's enemies, just moving forward, seeing new layouts and what I get to do next. Having the choice between movement or shooting and not being able to always do both, depending on how you manage your energy, is a really interesting twist that totally adds to the game's aesthetic. Because, oh, the 1800s steampunk aesthetic is absolutely clean, and the old-timey guns in this game are really satisfying to shoot. Seeing a horde of aliens just blow up, unloading on them completely, highlighting these moments in such a way just makes the process even more worth it. How I could play 
play XCOM, but I could also just be a racist. If Lincoln, yeah, he freed the slaves. Yeah, you might have heard of him. All right, come on. He never saw a slur on, on, pur on purpose or, or, or accident. The American war didn't actually happen in this world, though, I think. England and America are still allies, and in this timeline, aliens decided to invade. See how we dodged a bullet there? Unfortunately, it seems CNS had a very slightly lukewarm reception. So I looked into impressions from around the game's release and found a few interesting things. It didn't have a fast forward feature at launch, and apparently there were problems with loading and a choppy frame rate that made gameplay just a bit more of a chore. Thinking about it, I, I would feel the same way if there was no fast forward. The most common thing that I've seen are uh, people not really impressed by what it was trying to go for. Austria complains that it's an average, bland strategy game. Poopy faces. All the controls being hard to get used to. That That is a legitimate issue. Lots of people are dismissive of a game if it doesn't immediately click. They want their time savored. Well, they did update the game, so at least now I would go ahead and say Codename Steam is genuinely great. Satisfying payoffs to long waits and long stretches of did I, did I make the right move? And then being blasted away is what hooked me here. It's just different somehow. With the various map designs providing verticality with exploration and the characters that serve continuously useful purposes to warrant even swapping, there is enough variety here to keep the core gameplay from getting too stale. I will admit that Codename Steam doesn't have that much depth or a gripping story like Fire Emblem, but it's a 3DS game. For the platform, it more than fits those portable play sessions. For the insanely low price you can currently find it at, uh, th there's no reason not to have it. If you like strategy games, or if you're not familiar with them, or if you like not being familiar with anything, it's a good buy. Alright, next up is... Uh... Do not eat ice. Now, now, now. Hang on a minute. I know you just saw the name Sonic Boom frowning in disgust, wrapped up the sandwich you were eating, uh, gathered all the plastic wrappers on your desk, but then go into the trash, check your phone real quick to clear the notifications, and reclined. But it's people like you, rascals like you, that are sh all over Sonic's good name. Sick of it. Even if you make a, a few good points. <clears throat> the Boom is a tainted name. For what? All because of one disaster I, I, and a sh 3DS game resulting in a double whammy and, and also some controversial redesigns and uh, 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 and and miss. But the TV show was truly great with super memorable humor. And sure, two out of four boom games suck. One out of four boom game is <laughs> but the other, well, voila. Paradise truly was a fun game and uh, no one played it, so I can say that. <laughs> you, you can't disprove me. The sheer unpopularity of this Sonic game makes sense. If you're a Sonic fan who didn't even know it existed, I, I wouldn't blame you. Fire and Ice came out at a very awkward time. September 2016 was a time when boom hype was severely dwindling down. Many of us approaching and then not approaching, and even Sonic Project 2017 was on the way. In the face of a potential true return to form, after multiple meh releases, you really think another pseudo 2D boom game was gonna cut it? Hell, Gridius relevance in general was lowering at this point. A new Sonic spin-off on it wasn't really gonna turn heads. And especially a Sonic Boom game. The few people that might have been interested were already gonna be wary. Even I passed up on getting it back then. And I was a huge Sonic fan. But around six years down the line? With some space from all of that toxic discourse surrounding Boom? I like Fire and Ice. They nailed the Sonic feel that they already had in Shattered Crystal. But this time, progression is, uh, what's the word, sane? And the fun parts were doubled down on. Needing to stop and get every collectible isn't a problem anymore. You just beat the levels and keep going. The two games look similar, but it's pretty obvious which is the better game. The, the one with the f fires, is that it? Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, that one. So I know you're burning with the question. What? Do the R and L do? I'm sick. Of, I'm sick of that question so goddamn much. Well, you can either light yourself on fire or enjoy frostbite. And get used to it. This is the main gimmick you're going to be playing around with. Fire can melt ice. Ice can freeze water. I 
can drink milk really fast. You, you need to keep an eye on your aura while you're moving, as the game interrupts and challenges you with changes in the level design that require you to switch between the two styles constantly. This isn't done in a way that's obnoxious or unbounded. The two abilities really help keep you laser focused on the gameplay. It really doesn't have the issue of automation. Something else Fire and Ice does that's pretty nice is having the full map under the gameplay on the bottom screen. Really taking advantage of the third dual screen here. It's useful to get a heads up on my progression so I can be aware of where I should be going, what might be ahead. Other 3DS games do this. Yeah, I can see it all. Tie that all in with tight controls, knuckles, Amy, surprisingly fun bosses. Just really cool, mazy level design that will constantly come up with new gimmicks to challenge you. And you can't forget a variety of side missions to help break the ice. And you have a very solid Sonic game. Is it perfect? Is it amazing? No, apart from a few creative standouts, level aesthetics do look and feel unmemorable with that plain art style that Boom has. Knuckles' face is a beehive and they don't get too crazy with the main gimmick. What Fire and Ice does, it does very well. Enough to feel fresh throughout each world. As a platformer, it's consistently good and almost never falters. Sometimes solid is fine, especially if the alternative is liquidation. Urine! Ten people talk about this game a week. I was seven of them. I'd even go so far as to say it's on par with other 2D platformers on the console. Hell, I, I alright prefer it over New Mario 2. Yeah, I like it when my games have flavour. Sales wise, I have a I have a good feeling it probably did worse than Rise of Lyric. Although we'll probably never know since they've never released official overall total sales figures for it. But speaking of sales figures, I'm hungry. Mm. <sighs> Maybe I'll have some sushi. If you told me there was a puzzle game out there revolving tossing sushi into a plate and getting combos to fuel your sushi Pokemon's power in a fight to defeat the sushi empire, I would believe you, it's not that preposterous. But why, what I wouldn't expect is for it to be pretty good, in which it is. Sushi Striker is a strange game. It released in 2018 as a dual release for both the 3DS and the Switch, you know, one of those games in that awkward time period. Hell though. The red guys even published it. There's something interesting to me about games releasing for consoles past their actual lifetimes. To keep pumping things into this zombie, you know, giving it a larger library past when it, well, should have expired, it, it truly can give you some of the most interesting, uh, technologically capable games that are, are truly taking advantage of the system that they're on. This isn't, this isn't really one of those games. But. Surprisingly, Sushi Striker completely flew under the radar for a lot of people. Yeah, I know it's a niche thing and all, but it has pretty fun and addictive gameplay. Yeah, you would think fans would be jumping at the thought of another brand new Nintendo IP and okay, never mind, I get why it was overlooked. Almost full price, wow. Having played a big chunk of the game at this point, buying it on the cheap years later, I'm certain this price tag was worth it, never. Like, I do think the game is good, but you need a lot more than that to justify a big price tag, something to entice people to buy the game, especially when this game was a new face and not really established. People are always wary to trust a new IP from a developer that isn't very well known. Well, what do you do when you want to make bastard amounts of cash? Anime! Every cutscene in this game is done in anime, not unlike other games that also did their cutscenes in anime. But how many of those games revolve around sushi oppression? Like three, maybe four, but five, no. No, well, yeah, this would be the fifth fifth one, but imp important thing is, it's a unique concept. And I have to applaud them for coming up with this shit. This is a war about sushi, and no matter how silly you think that sounds, it is 
Fossilia. Usashi, or if you chose the female character, Usashi is the one true warrior who wants to break free from the oppressive regime, taking sushi away from everyone. And he's gonna have to team up with various sushi spirits to ultimately get back your loving, cherished master, whom you talk to for about, you know, four minutes. The Empire stole everyone's sushi and is using it to control the world. At some point, there is a rebellion that you join, the Sushi Liberation Front. This is the rebellion that helps you conquer the Empire in a war that spans various territories. Also, the soldiers have the most chiseled, muscled, glistening bodies in the entire vicinity. And it doesn't even matter because their sushi eating skills are trash. You could kill every army. Now you would expect this story to be boring, scratch that, who in hell would expect a game titled Sushi Striker The Way of Sushido to be boring in any sense. The narrative is a joyride. That's not a word you use lightly, that's how you know I'm serious. All the cutscenes are a nice refresher after a bunch of puzzle levels and are very well animated. The writing and dialogue is really funny, you know, every level has unique end quotes with legitimate replies to what they're saying from Musashi. And this guy is here too. I love this guy. It really feels like they were having a ton of fun developing this game. It's just brimming with personality and charm. Possibly the most of any 3DS game, and I fully mean that. Gameplay wise, Sushi Striker felt like nothing to me at first. It felt meh. I was swiping around, getting to grips and winning matches, but it just felt like stylus autopilot. It's after I played more and more that I began to understand what I was actually doing. I fell in love with that gameplay loop. So on the bottom screen, you have the little conveyor belt that lines up dishes. That is law accurate. In real life, there are sushi shops that put your order on these conveyor belts so you can grab what you ordered while waiting at your table. Yeah. Holding anything highlights for you what it can be combined with. Meaning you can't just pick anything up and swipe the whole console. What you want to do is grab the plates that have lots of the same colour and keep pushing your stylus around until you reach the double digits. Or as much as you can do. Naturally, there's going to be moments where there just isn't anything you can do with your plates, but it's better to just accept that and quickly complete a combo. Sushi is volatile, so holding it around is a no-go, and you can't do it from anywhere. Sushi does have to be lined up properly before you can keep combining. There are ways of speeding up the belt process, but that can either help or hinder you. Both of you have a life bar, which indicates how much sushi you can tolerate being thrown at your face before it just f gets annoying. On top of all that, you have three little sushi guys that you can encounter here and there. Dish sushi. These sushi spirits add to the foundation of the gameplay, as it decides what your strategy should be, how you're going to commit assault with some raw fish. Spirits do two things, decide how much health you have and how it's a special ability you can use with enough energy that you have to get by swiping enough plates. This can range from being a health power-up disclaimer, cavities do not do this in real life, or it can just be a power-up that makes a bunch of sushi immediately combinable, giving you a big plate stack in your arsenal. There are different types with different purposes and it helps to spice up the puzzle aspect to keep it from becoming too stale. And with a game like this, it will get old if you're just throwing players into the same gameplay. But in later levels, they really do make an attempt to mix it up. One way is by how different items can be thrown into the match. Gimmick items are on the shared belt and require a certain amount of sushi before activating, meaning both of you have an equal chance to completely catch the opponent off guard. One of these being a a, a bomb, a fuck, a fuck just a bomb that would kill him, he's dead. Time freeze too, look how goofy that is. Oh hell, levels can just be a minute to face off against a steel tank in a pleasant boss battle. No seriously though, uh, Sushi Striker is such an insanely creative game and it just boggles my mind, it's talked about so little. Graphically, it's very nice. All of the 2D drawn parts are the main display here and mesh well with the little low poly 3DS assets. That low poly style in general is uh, something that's gone away, so to see a 2018 game like this? It's just refreshing to look at, with style dashed all over the menus. Weird thing to point out, I, I know, I just feel these menus have such beautiful visual clarity. The whole pattern thing combined with nice colour combinations. Also quickly wanted to mention the music which is just mm. the first thing you see when you open the game is its own anime opening 
with the lyrics and the gameplay music. The map music, it's also catchy. For lack of a better term, Sushi Striker's music feels so, I don't know, bubbly, I guess, but it doesn't restrict itself to one identity. Now I'm kind of cheating here, Sushi Striker is also on Switch, but I'll be honest, the game really isn't as fun on the, it's yet another game where the dual screen plays to its advantage, and handheld mode is optional on the Switch anyway. Also the Switch did ship without a stylus hole, so, so the gameplay really should be <laughs> getting big combinations hitting those special plates, activating the Sushi Activating the sushi spirits all at once to get a big shiny S rank on the last hit is really satisfying. And for me, it was the moment where I saw how special of a game it is. Just great. If you're wanting a puzzle game that legitimately stands out among the crowd, hey, go ahead and get it. Oh, I have to say, this game really does make me crave some good old sushi. Shame, isn't it? Do you wanna be the very best? No, you wanna be a Pokemon killer. Dun, 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 dun. That's how, that's how. That's how it goes in, in some countries, you know? Yokai Mania was a massive success in 2015. They were flying off the roof shelves. They were selling out. No, they weren't. And what the hell even is a yokai? A, a, a hate crime? A Japanese slur? All three? In the 2010s, Level 5 was largely known for the Professor Layton series, all the while being responsible for a ton of other smaller niche games, like Dragon Quest. Level 5 would partner with specific companies, so this wasn't some company that came out of nowhere or was known for mediocrity. In fact, this new IP had actually been out for a whole two years by then. Yokai Watch was already a pretty decent success in Japan, so why the hell wouldn't everyone else like it? Well, first of all, I don't know. I have no earthly clue. Screw it! Bring it over, bring the sequels too, make an anime, make a plate line, create the plushies. It was a golden opportunity to make the franchise bigger worldwide. And who could forget Yokai Watch 3 if they don't even know it exists? Yokai Watch 3 is not easily affordable. There's three versions of the game in Japan, so they reciprocated and sent us three copies of the game. Like, okay, see this. I uh, got this from uh, Metroid. So I'm sure, you know, it's one of those, it's one of those booklets where they, you know, show you people dressed up as animals and whatnot. Ah, look at this! Look at that! Who, who can say if that exists? Who? It's basically false advertising. <laughs> Ironic that the first game is one of the best bang for your buck games on the console, as you can often find it for a pretty cheap price. While the third game is. well, that. Uh, there have been times when I can't even find it on British eBay. But my favourite one has to be Yokai Watch 1, as it's the only game in the trilogy I've played. I did not think I'd enjoy it much, and for the first hour, I was right. It honestly starts off kind of meh. They teach you the mechanics, show you the yokai, and also introduce the story. But look, give it time, this game does a great job of sucking you into the world, and it makes you want to explore and see what you come across. It becomes obvious how different it is is to other games on the console. Just get it out of your mind that this is another Pokemon copy, and you will enjoy it, because it is a lot more than that. Yokai Watch as a franchise revolves around spirit creatures that not everyone can see. You are a young boy who's made friends with a few and is discovering them in so many places around the town. By accident, on purpose, against your will, they were under his nose the entire time. Quickly, you get roped into this strange world, with a story that constantly throw you into these wacky situations such as a soul. 
and builds off of you really being the only one who can silently protect this town from all the weird things that seem to be popping up. There's never a dull moment apart from when Eugene asks for a Pepsi. The bulk of the dialogue is from Yokai, who are scattered around the world. Even they have their own problems for you to solve. Yokai are a whole cast of ghost like creatures with funny little faces and their own distinct personalities. Being that they have effects on the world around you, they can be the cause of an unusual cold. Or domestic disputes. Geraldine, uh, honey, I swear, it, it was the yokai that put me and your uncle on the plane to a spa resort ho hotel trip in Hawaii, I swear. These guys being mischievous and keeping a presence in the world gives you a pretty large helping of side quests that come from exploring the sea, which as you play through the game is constantly opening up new areas to explore, brand new quests and just a whole lot to do and look for. Check out every mark. They have everything. They have so some things. Seriously, it never ceases to surprise me how much they managed to fit into Yokai Watch 1. I can only imagine the sequels are the same. I can only imagine to actually find Yokai, look around in the sea, search the streets. It's so magical. Ooh, check out in the cars, trees, tr trash, just, just trash. On top of that, you'll naturally meet them as you play through the game and proceed on your journey, or you will encounter them in the overworld when you walk into some shady, dark place, like a high school. It captures that adventurous feeling you'd get as a kid pretty darn well. All of that is nice, but why play this as a game? Well, the combat system is pretty unique. It's not just a waiting game where you stare at a stupid bug that's two centimeters high, press the annihilation button, take an hour for the match to finish telling you your Pokemon gained 102 XP and then dare to touch a single grass particle, meet Lucifer. No, instead it uses a cute little wheel you can use to swap out your current fighters when they have low health. Putting in your other monsters, all six of your yokai available to fight. This isn't a game where you use one attack at a time. Rami has a type of super attack they can launch when their angry meter piles up just enough called a Sultimate. Sultimates aren't just there for you to click and watch, you are constantly engaged with the fight as you tap in bubbles, making an art piece, doing the most satisfying thing you can do with a stylus. As a whole, this uh, process of having to purify your team, flip your trio around, and maybe making sure the special link is connected, it's just very active and a very fun time. To me, it's a lot more exciting than turn-based RPGs tend to be. Someone is not the biggest fan. You can even set a specific target which affects not only the yokai you're hitting, but even the body part. And that brings me to the bosses, which in my opinion are actually the most fun part of the game. Targeting is most impactful there, as it tends to be pretty much necessary to being a boss. But the combination of constant strategy, needing to make moves quickly, dividing your attention between both screens, keeping an eye on your soul meter, your pastrami in the microwave the life of your yokai it is so good it really is satisfying seeing these guys get stronger and stronger because this game is no pushover it is pretty difficult to beat these yokai at times so you pretty much do need to grind to get past some of these obstacles and i've been knocked out or have had to retreat multiple times to actually capture these things you need to have a yokai ball <sighs> I, I, I don't have any, but trust me, it is, it is true. If you don't have a yokai ball, you can also do it by giving them food, as that makes them more trusting of you. It's just like me. Hell, they even throw you into a little stealth section in the overworld where if yokai can spot you, a bigger yokai hunts you down quickly. You can get good loot here, so there's a nice risk reward thing going on. The yokai themselves have great designs, <laughs> such dumb, ridiculous designs, but somehow they make all of them work perfectly, no matter how strange they are. Most characters don't seem like unmemorable mishmashes. I don't feel insulted looking at Panda, I just, I just feel sad. They it always had me wanting to see more of these little creatures, always intrigued in seeing what some god-fearing Japanese artist out there has concocted for me. This one's name starts with J, but you know what? Me too, man, me too. Don't get me wrong, Yokai absolutely takes a page out of Pokemon's book. That just isn't all it does. It looks at that formula and makes its own beast. I haven't fully played through Yokai yet, or, or any of its sequels, 
This game is wonderful. I do want to check out the sequels at some point after I've robbed a bank. I really can't understand how this series was so unpopular in the West that the company had to abandon all Western prospects. The fourth game was even exclusive to Japan. Uh, luckily the Switch is region free but uh, well it's just <laughs> it's it's crazy how much this game grows on you. I know for a fact many people have been dissatisfied with Pokemon ever since X and Y, even more so after Sword and Shield. You want a supplement? Here you go. Take it. It's a classic. It's just an instant classic. A Pokemon. Who? Pokemon reconnaissance, deception, infiltration, ambush, and. Those are all characteristics of the shinobi. That's pronounced as shinobi. Xenophobia. The sake of made games that aren't Sonic for some reason, and this is one of them, supposedly. There's a good chance you've at least heard of shinobi if you're big into gaming as a whole, or if you're big into real life. This ninja franchise started way back in the arcades, eventually making its way onto home consoles and worked up onto various Sega systems. But soon they would enter the world of 3D gaming for a triumphant return with a grand total of three. It never was the most prolific franchise, e even in its heyday, but I do gotta give props to Sega for giving it a go on a modern system. It's just with how this one's sold, I'm not really surprised. Sega doesn't really give Shinobi any time of day. You know, from the outside looking in, this will just seem like a generic ninja franchise and this cover art really doesn't do it any favors. That's not to say they shouldn't attempt a new entry. Ninjas are hip. The kids nowadays swear allegiance to Japan. They, they, they straight up do. Just uh, you make damn good polished gameplay and people are sure to swarm that game like flies. Except for the times they don't. But you know what my nickname in high school was? Musica Domestica. Do you know what I mean? Now, if you've played the earlier Shinobi games, or even played the old Ninja Gaiden games, ah, well, then <laughs> tell me if I'm hot or cold. I barely have experience with the Shinobi franchise. Yeah, I have not played any of those, this, or even, I'm scared of that. So, I apologize to the entire Shinobi fan base currently closing in on my position, crawling on my neighbor's rooftop. Do you know how fing noisy you are? I don't. I don't know what the standards for this franchise are, besides the one hour I spent on the Sega Ages Switch version, it was okay, it's not calculator, but it's okay. But that said, if someone like me can have such a great time with this game, a zero experience and all, I don't see why everyone shouldn't give Shinobi 3D a try. It's basic to understand, what you see is certainly what you get. Shinobi is a side-scrolling, platforming, slash-me-up ninja game. But who the hell decided hit basic has to mean boring? What, the, the dictionary people? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, that's, that's an appropriate definition. Well, for so, so, so long, I was looking for something on the 3DS that could scratch that itch of a pure action game. Something that makes you feel strong, feel cool. Hyrule Warriors. Castlevania, they were okay, but not quite what I was looking for. Hyrule Warriors is a, a Musou game anyway, I, I, I know what to expect there. But I find out about Shinobi and yeah, yeah, no, this is what I wanted. Just, just the way you slash, somersault, deflect a stab away and throw Japanese objects. It, it, it really, it really, really culminates into such a... Bad ass experience. That's the best way to put it. It makes you feel like an ass. Yeah. Side scrolling and platforming blend into this main combat gameplay so so well. You're timing your jump so you don't succumb to 
water, climb onto ledges, but simultaneously counterattack a large variety of enemies. Shinobi is all about memorizing patterns, so you want to remember who you murder, because you're gonna see them again. Knowing what they're gonna do adds a fun layer of skill into it. You, you can strategize this way and think about how you want to tackle that. It really does expect a lot of you, but Burry Controls make it all about how good you are. If you screw up, it really is your screw up, and never, never do I feel the controls are at fault, and never do I get the ick from jumping. Uh, that's all very important in a game like this. It's snappy, it's satisfying. This particular rising slash, oh, I just wanna, I just wanna do it again. And again, I won't do that though. It, that would be foolish and unnecessary. Admittedly, you don't have access to that many different attacks. There is no skill tree. What you're capable of in the first level is what you're gonna be capable of the entire game. But there is enough to attack with in that somehow it really doesn't get old doing the same combos. Even even after hours of playing. On the bottom screen, you get four magic tricks activated with L. An all out attack, a shield that deflects, a shield that just wants to be a dick so it takes your life force. I'm not gonna tell you what the last one does. You need to be smart with how you unleash the power. But more importantly, when you do it, you only get one of those per life. These uh, boxes are a thing. <laughs> yeah, boxes. Uh, papaya? Jewel? I don't, I don't know. Oh, I remember. It gives you score. Useless thing, fried chicken. <laughs> Ninjas don't eat chicken. Ninjas do eat chicken. With games like this, exploration is rewarded with extra lives, health power-ups, other things all scattered throughout the map. All items that, if you remember to grab, will be a tool you can use to get through the level. You have five items and if you are not good enough to get through an entire level, which can be like half an hour, two hours if you suck, uh, you, you do have to go through that all over again. No mid checkpoints. That can be very frustrating as the levels have phases you pass through, so it can get to a point where you find yourself bored of doing the same thing you just did before. And if you want a game that doesn't ask much of you, it, it is not the right pick. Dabbling in variety means these types of sections really annoy at least half of the people that are gonna play it. But like I said, it is about what you tolerate in difficulty. A shinobi is is big on muscle memory and being prepared for what you fight. Kind of like Mega Man, uh, that's the best thing I could compare it to. Now maybe it's because I have Pringle tube fingers and black brain arm coordination, uh, but, th th but this game really is fucking hard. It, it expects so much of you. At times, I, I feel that's to the game's detriment. Closing off the c casuals, right? Uh, on a casual market like the 3DS in its earliest year, the releases that would be way more important to people, and not just on that console, you can probably take a guess as to why it bombed. Uh, Cause 2 was within buying parameters. Really, it would have fit better on almost anything but the 3DS. Maybe the V or the 360 arcade. If it had to be a 3DS game, it would have done more well if it just, I don't know, came out in like a, a 2015 or, or hell, 2012 even. Now, if you can look past that frustration, this game is great. Uh, definitely worth the time you need to put into it, as the feeling of then pulling said gameplay off is incredibly satisfying. Hearing that tink go off after a successful parry, oh, that really is good. Sorry, wise, yeah. So honorable, so so moving. This is a ninja story with all the nuance, and I don't know what happened, but hey, these animated still images look pretty cool. Shinobi is crazy. Whatever. I don't need a story. I just need to freaking kill people. It's true this game doesn't reinvent the wheel. It and it, and it probably isn't as unique as some of the other games in the 3DS's library. Ever Oasis may be one of the more eviler games on the 3DS, as it lets players assume the role of a landlord. Quezo! It does, doesn't that sound like a like a derogatory term? <laughs> uh, or is it just me? Yeah, I mean, it is. Just ask any Majora's Mask fan. I dare you. Quezo had a hand in creating all the Zelda remakes, you know, uh, Ocarina 3D. <laughs> Man, I, I love Ocarina 3D. Seriously, my favorite Zelda game. I play the N64 version before, so 
you know, going through a whole of those upgrades was, it really, it, it felt very substantial. Grizzle are actually not owned by Nintendo, they are their own studio that allegedly likes working with Nintendo. They've had 10 games published by Miyamoto out of 14 games the company has even made since 2008. But Ever Oasis? That's the first IP Grezzo truly created as their own baby. I don't count Line Attack, it has a stupid name. Ever Oasis came out three months after the Switch did. It was overlooked like most games that come out three months after the Switch does. From that point on, Nintendo then made it their mission to release 3DS games. Now this game was pretty out there for me, you know, for my taste. I do step out of my comfort zone, but there wasn't anything I was seeing in these trailers to make me think, yeah, okay, I, I need this. So I bought it. Ever Oasis is this type of city building slash uh, action game. The city building part isn't like, a, I don't know, a Sim C. It's more grabbing these cute little things by the nostril and saying, hey, Live with me. The overall loop is straightforward. You you want to grow this place of yours, the oasis. You want to fill it with people. You want to expand it. You had a cool ass one with designer, neon lights before, but chaos, the enemy monsters of the game, destroyed it. Oh, and your brother died too. So when you meet this water spirit after being launched away, the first thing you do is f this sand up. After that, it's up to you to venture out into the world and see if there's anyone out there. It starts off with checking a simple cave out, but there are points when you get challenged with a big dungeon, straight up Zelda style. Seedlings are your race and are gonna be the primary race here. They are the only ones who can make a bloom booth. What is a bloom booth? What could that be? It's a shop. It's just a shop, but I'm kind of quirky though. So I call them marvelous markets. You can't build up this oasis without people or without a bunch of markets. And the best way of doing this is walking into caves and potentially running into travelers. They might need help with something like being lost. Whatever it is, you want to help them to eventually recruit them. Although there are times when Tails just finds you, making that process a lot easier and giving you even more quests. Fulfill what they want from this oasis as what they want can lead to another person. Also, it's kind of fun. Maybe they want a particular fruit, material, or even a specific bloom booth to warrant staying here. It's rewarding to discover another person in a journey, which is necessary for Oasis growth. All oh, that is great, but why wouldn't it be better if I took three hours to explain it to you? See, that, 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 that was three seconds, and that was painful. I had to practically force myself to care about Ever Oasis at first. They take a while to get your thick skull into this gameplay loop. It was seriously irritating uh, having to sit through a constant tutorial with constant babying, and I very seriously considered just quitting the game. Marvelous markets cannot function without you being there to keep the stock in check. So get out there and hit some bots, farm some fruit, hoard anything you can. I'd say it's a pretty good guarantee I'm gonna need squirrel guts down the line. With each new seedling is a new market to set up in your town, and more money that you can only collect by attacking it with a hurricane for some reason. These marvelous markets specialize in one thing, fruit, so we got it all, vegetables. So make sure that one thing is well stocked and hey, if you complete special quests given to you by the Bloom Booth, it becomes two things. As the game progresses, it really does get easier and easier to manage and do what you want. You become more capable through eventual leveling up per gear, warp points taking you instantly to locations, new attack combos, a stocking station that allows you to mass restock all at once. And obviously you can't forget the action aspect of of it, exploring the overworld, killing demons, taking down a great tree to obtain fruit. However, you, you can only go so far without peering inside of these caves and locations. And if all that gameplay looks familiar, if that gameplay stinks of Zelda, it's because like I said before, Grezzo are thieves. From the camera tilts to the combat, it really is a pretty smart usage of resource. They're disgusting thieves, but I... It, it is smart what they did here. This part of the game is very much like the dungeons in Ocarina or, or Majora. 
Zelda usually requires a very particular item that you need to have collected, and items are all equipped by Link. Every oasis requires people's lives. Maybe this one is the only one who can dig holes in the ground. Maybe this one can be a flower. All these abilities are what you need for the vast majority of puzzles in these caves slash uh, dungeons. It's like figuring out the right pieces to a puzzle, except you need to go back home to get all the pieces. You'd think this gets tedious, but actually it gets annoying. Luckily, you can just warp in and out of places to reform your team if need be, which becomes pretty much essential every time you walk into a dungeon. As for the actual dungeons themselves, you know, it's they're not gonna win awards. They aren't exactly geniusly designed, but the way you move forward is just interesting and challenging enough to feel rewarding when you finally understand how to get to the next room. The levels are straightforward, but I wouldn't say they're outright easy. The overworld itself is a bit empty, but I do feel everything else I just talked about compensates for it. The RPG slash adventure aspect of this really is solid, and anytime you come back you'll have found materials and gained XP. Then, getting back home to attend to your oasis is really comfy. Gardening, planting seeds, meeting with all the people, you know, customizing your gear. And maybe it's just me, but I swear, I swear this place is turning green, I, I just realized I sound like a crazy person saying that, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure the oasis gains more vegetation and a sense of life over time from being very sandy and deserty, you know, around the beginning. But that could all just be in, in, in my mind. Now, Ever Oasis is a one and done game. These characters with all their quests aren't randomly generated as far as I can see. So it will get to a point when when this loop is just based on how long you want to keep managing the town. But tell me if that main game isn't just fantastic. And, and it really is. Burying into caves, trying to figure out puzzles by pulling out my trusted toolkit of people, finding that one item I've been dying for. Just to finally accomplish what I set out to do, and fulfill a, a seedling's quest is really rewarding. It's that feeling of growth that really grips you in these types of games. That desire to see your oasis that, that you lead get better and better while, while you run around restocking every pineapple for these ungrateful little- yeah, I, I should tear these marvelous markets down! It's a good game, but, but the thing about Ever Oasis is that it does have some uh, quality of life problems, it, things that make it a little bit more clunky than it needs to be. Like you can't sleep until it's night. What? Do you hate people who work night shifts, Grezzo? Do you? Hey though, that, that's the perfect opportunity, you know, it's looking at what this game did wrong and coming back stronger later. Being created on a more powerful platform, that's it's gonna happen. It's Game Design 101, make a sequel to a game no one played for pretty much maximum profit. Still a fun experience, but... There's, there's definitely things here that could have been better. Also, there's nothing I can find suggesting it did well financially, like, at all. It definitely isn't a part of the One Million Club, so it's like every game I talked about here apart from one. Yokai was, uh, well, it was, it was actually fairly successful in one country. I honestly have never played a game like Ever Oasis. It, it was a refreshing experience, and definitely one that I'm gonna remember when thinking about the Nintendo 3DS. I think that was a, that was a good list of games that aren't really talked about that much, you know, that, that, don't, that don't really seem to get that much of a spotlight. Um, games that just tend to be overshadowed by, you know, the big boys on the console. The truth is, I've only touched the tip of the iceberg. That is the 3DS's library. With how many 3DS games are out there, who knows what we're all missing out on. I believe the 3DS was one of Nintendo's most experimental libraries. Maybe even the most. And that's saying something, considering it's... Nintendo. It may have lacked in some areas, uh, but for the most part, on this little machine, you had access to so, so much variety and quality. Oh, but don't you worry, my pretty. I wouldn't abandon you. Oh, there's, there's too many good games on you. There's so many games I haven't gotten the chance to play yet. There's, 
Uh, you, I sure do have feelings for you. Oh, uh, you, you beautiful oiled machine. 